Industrial Revolution was fantastic for creating some of our, our systems, but it's going to be looked back upon as the greatest catastrophic period in the history of the Earth. So we've got to move from a point of devastation of the Earth to a point of balance and harmony with the Earth. We have to really look ahead 20, 30, 50 years out. In those times when energy, at least petroleum, that energy is going to be scarce. We think that there's going to be a shift. And in that period, there's going to be concentrations of population in the urban centers. And the rural areas, we think, should be preserved for farms like this. This is 350 acres. This portion of the property is, is an organic farm. About 10 years ago, I had sold a company and had the option of investing the proceeds of that sale in stocks and bonds and things that were pretty uninteresting to me or in buying land. We live out here, but we also host what we call the Pickards Mountain Eco Institute. What we're trying to do is find practical solutions to the ecological crisis. We're trying to demonstrate ways to generate our own power. We power the farm with a wind system, a 2.5 kilowatt proven wind turbine that produces about 400 kilowatt hours a month for us, which is about half a typical U.S. household consumes. And then we have a tracking solar array here with 2.4 kilowatts of solar arrays. And it tracks with the sun. It's got a little photovoltaic cell at the top. And as the sun moves through the sky, we track the sun so that we get about another four hours of usable sunlight. What we're trying to look at here is, is this differentiation between really dense urban living, which is environmentally sensitive because you're, you can walk and bike to your services and to your work, and then having the outlying areas be more committed to farms and energy and providing some of the resources for the urban center. We make our own biofuels. We grow our own food. We do raise some livestock. We've got pigs here that we rotate through different parts of the land. We raise goats. We have chickens that produce eggs for us. We have about 30 chickens that produce about 20 eggs for us every day. We also provide an opportunity for mostly young people to come and work on the farm and learn about these different systems. So here we have two of our all-stars. <laughs> Margaret from Lukens is our garden manager. And, uh, and Margaret is also the sort of leader of, uh, of an effort in our neighboring community, Carborough, called the, um, it's part of the transition cultures uh, process, yeah. like the Totnes program. Transition towns. Transition yeah, yeah, towns, yeah. yeah. Yep. So, oh, wow. Um, totally a transition town now. Uh oh. Yeah. So, it just got official a week or two ago. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. And so why did you decide to get part of, become part of all this? I don't feel like eating organic is enough. <laughs> um, I think that we need to find more thorough solutions. There was broccoli and collards and things growing here, so the parsley is remaining. But I would say that the transition town movement is about increasing local resilience to challenges or shocks that might happen because of peak oil or climate change. I'm not sure what these guys are. I'm pretty sure they're not good. Oh no, maybe these might be assassin bugs, which are awesome actually. Because they eat other bugs. <laughs> the median age for farmers nationwide is something like 50 years old. We need more young farmers. I would like to be a farmer for the rest of my life. Cherry tomatoes here that have been kicking butt all summer. I want to be able to provide for myself off of the land. And it'd be great if I could provide for other people too. Hey guys. There are ways that things used to be done that we just don't even realize anymore because we were raised with all this convenience all this separation from where things come from. Most of the meat in this country is from concentrated animal feeding operations, which are horrible for the animals, horrible for the environment, because you take something that used to be a resource, like manure, uh, fertility, there you go, which was on the farm, helping to produce vegetables, and you take it away and you put it into, into lagoons that get poisonous, not just because it's such a huge concentration of poop, but because when you put so many animals in an area like that, you have to feed them antibiotics constantly so that they don't die from all the sicknesses going around. So it's like, one of the big things about raising pigs this way is that we are eating pigs who had happy lives. She likes to be pet a lot. She's a sweet, sweet pig. Aren't you? You're a sweet pig. Yeah. I don't eat industrial meat. When an animal gives the gift of its life, I think it's important that it's been respected for its whole life. It's a hard day when we take these pigs to the butcher. Like, it, it sucks. <laughs> but I feel like I want that relationship with my food and my meat especially. Like, I want to be sad when it dies because that is evidence of connection. Any disconnect from that is just sort of increasing the general disconnect from the earth and the things it provides for us. So I think there's a reason for sadness when you kill your pigs.
and that's the way it should be. The whole transition communities program is looking at sort of 2050 as a point at which the transition needs to have been made. There's really not much growing in here right now. The IPCC says that we have to reduce our greenhouse gas output by 80 percent relative to 1990 levels by 2050 and that requires very dramatic change. The greenhouse is important if you're going to try to have food during the winter without shipping it from Florida or California. When people sort of wake up to the reality of how real climate change is, how quickly it's happening, how urgent a problem it is, and how indeed oil is not, at least cheap oil, is not going to last forever. That's like such a big realization that people basically go into denial and paralysis, and I think the transition approach does a good job of addressing that reaction and sort of helping people come to a place of action instead of one where they just want to go back under the covers. This cottage is a cob cottage. Mike and Greg, who's inside, have been working hard on it for months and months. Cob is actually a pretty ancient building material. It's clay and straw and sand or some other aggregate. You can pretty much always use local building materials. Like all of the clay in this house comes from this land in like probably 50 feet of the house. <laughs> the transition town movement, it addresses all the sectors. It's not just how do we feed ourselves, it's also how are we going to create sustainable housing and transportation and energy and how are we going to create communities that we like to live in that we all know each other. The West Wall is complete. It's it was, beautiful. It was just finished. There have been a lot of different hands that have helped out. So it's been like a community at least, of building yeah, this at least cottage. 30, Thirty people have had a hand in some part of the house. I think that definitely people will not be able to live in large homes in the suburbs. I think that people will not be able to live in large homes. So you can see this is a pretty small place. It's ten and fifteen on its longest dimension. Bed goes there, and then you know it'll be just on the side of this, which will be my desk. And then a wood stove in the corner, and I'll have a little chair for my desk, and shelving for books, clothing, hopefully not much else. I think part of it will inevitably have to be about scaling down, and I think another part of it is going to be this great increase in our quality of life. I'm going to have to get rid of some stuff, which is great. I think we can focus on the really important things, and we don't have to worry about how we're managing all our stuff. If you look at these conditions as market forces, as opposed to catastrophic events that are coming, if you view them as market forces, then they're enormous numbers of business opportunities. The roof is one of the big things helping to keep the building cool. It's like dirt and plants on top, absorbing the sun and using it instead of just having it be another reflective surface. There are opportunities to build green buildings. There's opportunities to generate power in different ways. There's opportunities to design vehicles. There's opportunities basically to recreate this modern world. Instead of avoiding these issues, as if they're gonna go away, you know, we need to be embracing them and looking at what the solutions are. This little girl may live to the year 2100. The year 2100 is gonna be a very, very different time. We've got to provide systems for these guys both to be able to live healthy lives but also to be able to enjoy the natural world. And if we don't get that right, then it really is going to be pretty devastating for these guys and their children. I hope it's not too late and I will operate on that assumption. <laughs> Do what I can. <laughs> hey goats, come on out. Learn how to grow food. Learn how to take care of animals. Learn how to live simply, which is so much more rewarding. <laughs> and this is Tuck. Tucks are milking goat, she's a good goat.